Okay. Musical instruments produce sounds in various ways, vibrating strings, violins, guitars, vibrating membranes, drums, vibrating med or wood, wood, metal or wood shapes, and vibrating air columns. So the uh, triangle would be a vibrating shape, right? And that's uh, an orchestral instrument. Okay. So you can start the vibration by plucking, striking, bowing or blowing. Some of the ways. The vibrations are transmitted to the air and then to our ears. So here's a guitar and we can see that you can effectively shorten the strings on a guitar by fingering and thus raising the fundamental pitch as shown here. In this case you can see here we have a fundamental wave, right? standing wave here, but by putting our fingers on the wavelength of that fundamental wave has changed. The pitch of a string of given length can also be altered by using a string with a different linear density. That's something we came across in the, part, in the previous chapter, right? The concept of linear density, mass per unit length. And in fact, if you look at a guitar and you look at the strings on a guitar, what do you see? Who plays guitar? Anyone? Have you? Yeah, what do you notice about the strings on a guitar? Are they all the same? No, they're different sizes. They're different sizes, so they're different thicknesses, and they're different masses, right? Mm -hmm. Some are, are they still use catgut, or do they use nylon now? Don't know? Okay. And some are metal, right? A piano covers more than seven octaves. So these lower strings down here are both much longer and much heavier than these ones up here. That's how we can get that range. Notice how the length is changing. The length doesn't change according to a simple multiplication factor because the frequency is inversely proportional to the length, right? That's why it's this funny shape. It's almost a, almost a 1 over x type shape, isn't it? This. Wind instruments create sound through standing waves in a column of air, just like this one does. setting up a standing wave. But when we take one end off, the pitch changes. So what we're going to do now is see why that is. First of all, we'll look at one which has both ends open. That's most wind instruments. I believe the clarinet actually has one end closed. I think most wind instruments actually have both ends open. In order to analyze this, we look at two things which are complementary. One is the pressure inside the tube, it's shown over here, and this is the displacement of air inside the tube. Now, this is representing, if you like, whether or not the pressure is high or low. The pressure difference compared to the outside. You can imagine this is right at the point of the opening. The pressure difference between this point here and something just outside really can't exist. 
right? Everything is going to be about the same pressure. But what happens is as you come inside, because this is constrained and it's also a certain distance away, the pressure can in fact build up momentarily. So in this case, we get a standing pressure wave where this is high pressure and this is no pressure difference, right? High pressure difference, no pressure difference. It looks like a string that's fixed at both ends, doesn't it? Looks just the same as the standing wave set up for a string that's fixed at both ends. If we look at the displacement of the air, that is, the air moving like this, right? And we think about that. Obviously, at the ends, <coughs> there's nothing to stop the air from actually moving freely. And in fact, that's how we get the sound, right? Because what is sound but periodic vibrations of the air. And if what you're doing is displacing the air, that's effectively what the vibration is. So in this case, this is exactly the same as this. I mean, in this case, we're looking at pressure. In this case, we're looking at displacement. And here you can look and you can see the magnitude of the displacement. That's what that's supposed to be representing, right? So the air is going like in and out, almost like the membrane on a drum, right? Almost like the membrane, not exactly the same, but sort of. This is the motion of the air molecules. So if we look at this, how many wavelengths is this representing? Right, a half a wavelength. So the length of the tube, in the case of a tube that's open at both ends, represents half the wavelength. Or put another way, if we want to get the wavelength, what do we do to the length of the tube? Double it. Double it, right. So lambda, in this case, is 2 times L. I like looking at the pressure in this particular one because I find it difficult to look at that and say that's half a wavelength. This here I can see easily for me. It looks like half a wavelength. So it just depends. One of the things you might want to do if you're trying to think about these problems is draw yourself a little diagram like this. It will help you remember rather than having to remember the equation, which I know you love to plug and chunk, but I think that it's better to understand what's going on because then it doesn't matter what the situation is, you can figure out how things are going to work. If we look at the second harmonic, we get the same thing. Because it's open at both ends, it's symmetric, we get a node at both ends again. Second harmonic gives us a node in the center. The interesting thing about musical instruments is that the fundamental and the overtones can all exist at the same time in varying relative strengths. And we'll see what that means a little later. In this case, we have one wavelength going this whole length. So that tells us that we want to find what the uh, wavelength of the second harmonic is. We've got what? We just got to look at the what do we have to look at? Get the wavelength of the second harmonic. What is it? Sorry? You've got a tube, right? Yeah. It's just the length of the two. Right? One wavelength fits in the length of the two. It's just the length of the two. If we look at the third harmonic, and we count this, we see we've got one and a half wavelengths. 
So if we want to get the wavelength of the third harmonic, what do we have to do? Yeah? Divide the length of the two by 1.5? Yeah, so all you multiply it by? Two thirds. Right? Multiply it by two thirds. Let's have a look at an example. What will be the fundamental frequency in the first two overtones for a 26 centimeter long organ pipe at 20 degrees C if it is open at both ends? Let's decode. We've got a length of 0.26 meters, temperature of 20 degrees C. The speed of sound at 20 degrees C is 343 meters per second. What is the wavelength? We don't know. What is the fundamental frequency? What is the second harmonic? What is the third harmonic? We look at our little thing here and we say, ah, okay, the tube is open at both ends. Therefore, the fundamental wavelength is half the length, is twice the length of the tube. Right? So we can just write that down. 2 times 0.26 is 0.52. We now have the wavelength. We have the wavelength, we have the velocity, and so now we can easily calculate what the frequency is of the fundamental. It's the velocity divided by the wavelength, or 343 meters per second, divided by 0.52 meters, or 660 hertz. Now, rather than repeat that calculation over and over, we need, just need to remember the following. A tube which is open both ends has overtones or harmonics at all integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So if you want the second harmonic, you multiply the fundamental by two. If you want the third harmonic, you multiply the fundamental by three. The fourth harmonic, you multiply by four. So if we want the second harmonic, or the first overtone that appears, it's 2 times F1, or 2 times 660 hertz, which is 1320 hertz. The second overtone, the third harmonic, is 3 times the fundamental, 3 times 660 hertz, or 1980 hertz. Is that clear? Okay, now let's have a look at one where the tube is closed at one end. Now we have a situation where things are not symmetric anymore. They're no longer symmetric. So, with this end closed, you can see that the maximum pressure is going to build up here because the air has nowhere to go. Similarly, there's not going to be much displacement of the air. Again, because it's got nowhere to go. At this end, the pressure has to be about the same as atmospheric pressure. At this end, we actually get displacement of the air. Right? So, we look at this one and we say, okay, how many wavelengths fit into the length of a closed tube? A quarter, a quarter of a wavelength. So if I want to get the wavelength knowing the length of the tube, what do I do? I multiply by four, exactly. Now, we come to something different. Now, we find because we've got a non-symmetric case, suddenly we cannot get even numbered harmonics out of this thing. Right? There's no way I can get a node at this end and a node at this end which would make it symmetric because it's closed. The next one up is the third harmonic. So the third harmonic looks like this. How many wavelengths are in there in that length of the third harmonic. Hmm? Three quarters. Three quarters, right. So if I want to get 
the wavelength from the length of the tube I multiply by Sorry? Three. Four over three. Four thirds, exactly. Again, you can see the same thing here. If I go to the next one, again, because it's not a symmetrical situation, I cannot have nodes at both ends or antinodes at both ends. So again, I have to skip the even multiple. And what I end up with here is what? How many wavelengths in a length of that? Five plus four. There's, yes, one and a quarter wavelengths, exactly. And how many, if I want to get the wavelength, how many lengths of the tube do I have to multiply by? Four over five. Four over five, exactly. So let's have a look at an example. It's the same example, but now we're just going to close one end of the tube. Length is 0.26 meters. Temperature 20 degrees C. Velocity of sound 343 meters per second. We don't know what the wavelength is. We want to know what the fundamental is. We want to know what the first two overtones are. And here's our situation. So for the first harmonic or fundamental, what do we know about the relationship between the wavelength and the length of the tube? If we want to get wavelength from the length of this tube, what do we have to do? We have to multiply by four because only the first or fundamental has only a quarter of a wavelength existing in it, right? We multiply by four which gives us a wavelength of 1.04 metres out of this shorter two. We now plug that in and we find that the frequency has dropped by a factor of two. Let's do an experiment. Here's the open one. What are we expecting to happen? Which will mean what to the pitch? Be lower pitched. Which it is. Okay, so that helps us. We now can predict. So if you wanted to make yourself a musical instrument, you would know how to do it, providing you knew what frequency each um, pitch was. Yes? Um, does it change again? Uh, sorry? Does it change it again if we put a cover on the other end? It would, but then you wouldn't actually be able to hear anything. Right? But that doesn't mean to say that's a silly question. It's not, because if you look at a microwave oven, especially the the more like commercial ones, as opposed to the very that very cheap one I've got over there, in fact that is a resonator and you set up standing waves of microwaves inside. And if you want, you can actually determine the speed of light with that. Because on the back plate, it will tell you what frequency of microwaves they're using. And you can put something like chocolate in there if you don't take out the, the uh, rotating turntable. And let it in there for maybe 15, 20 seconds if you've got it spread out over the... And what you'll see is melting spots. And those melting spots are going to correspond to the antinodes, right, of the standing wave pattern that's been set up inside the resonator. Okay? Okay, next one. A tube which is closed, excuse me, a tube which is closed only has overtones or harmonics at odd integer multiples at the fundamental frequency. There will be no second harmonic. There will be a third harmonic, which you might call the first overtone that we see, which will be three times the fundamental, <laughs> three times 330 hertz or 990. And you'll have a second overtone, the fifth harmonic, which will be five times 330 hertz. 
or 1650 hertz. So, the question is, why does a trumpet sound different from a flute? Why does a piano sound different from a guitar or a violin? And the answer comes down to the overtones and how much each overtone is amplified or resonates inside the particular shape of instrument you have. With a violin, it makes a very big difference what the shape of the sound box is, as it does with the guitar. Right? And what you'll see is like a fingerprint. If you look at the frequency spectrum, you need an audio spectrum analyzer to do this, where you just look at the individual frequencies which are coming out, rather than try to look at the sine waves. You can, you can actually get a device which will tell you what frequencies, and so they end, end up being just, okay, I've got this frequency, that frequency, like that. It's called a, um, a frequency transform. So the fundamental has a relative amplitude of one compared to this frequency here, this one here, this, and I don't know, there's some missing, right? Some which are not resonating. Not all of them are resonating equally. <laughs> The same happens with the piano, right? We have different things resonating on that soundboard at different amplitudes, resulting in a different quality to the sound. They're all related because they're overtones. And so it doesn't sound discordant, but it gives the quality of the sound, what I call the timber. Some people call it timber, some people call it timbre, potato, potato, whatever you want to yeah, say. Banana. Yeah, banana. but I mean, I asked someone else in the previous class, they said they called it timber. What do you call wood on a truck then? Timber. Okay. Timber on a truck is pronounced the same way. <laughs> there are many words like that. Violin, relative amplitude, quite different. So now you know why musical instruments all sound differently, right?